Good morning, and a good day it is. Let's begin with a prayer. O Lord, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that ever mindful of the end of all things and the day of your just judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you forever hereafter. All this and only through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our dear Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let all God's people say amen. Dear sons and daughters of the King, that's a cool title. Sons and daughters of the King whose names have been written in the book of life. You've all had one of these days. It just comes out of nowhere. Sudden, surprise, no advance warning, nothing whatsoever to give you any sort of hint that this was going to be one of those days that is just like, bam! It's like being T-boned in a car accident, just out of nowhere. All of a sudden, your boss comes up to you, and things seem to be getting back to normal. Oh, they're saying, yeah, we may have to go back to wearing masks a little bit. Oh, you know... The COVID numbers are getting inching up and they're testing the sewer water. But you know, life seems to kind of be creeping back to normal a little bit. And you're kind of looking forward to the fact that maybe your retirement plan wasn't totally blown up by this whole thing. And all of a sudden, your boss comes to you and says, Getzinger, you know, I'm really sorry, buddy. You and I have been together here for how long? 28, 29 years? COVID has destroyed our business. I tried, but I got to let you go. Our, our company is done. You weren't expecting that. That came out of nowhere. Or you're just out for one of your walks, and you're enjoying God's weather, and it's absolutely wonderful outside, and you've got absolutely no hint whatsoever that anything's wrong on the inside. But then all of a sudden, you start getting a little shortness of breath, and you start noticing this pain kind of radiating down your arm, and it starts creeping across your chest, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is not right. Something's not quite savvy here with my body, and so you sit down on the park bench, and you find your your cell phone and you dial 911 and the paramedics come and they inform you, "Um, sir, we're taking you in because you're experiencing a heart attack right now. Bam! That came out of nowhere. What's going on with that? Or it's just one of those regular days. Oh, you woke up a little bit late, but man, boy, that bed was comfortable. You just kind of had to pry yourself out. Oh, it was nice and cozy in there on that fall morning, you know? And you're doing your normal shower and shave thing in the morning, and all of a sudden you're drying yourself off, and you notice, what the heck is going on down there? Wow, that's not supposed to be like that. And so you have your wife take a look at it, and well, there's a phone call to the doctor to find out what in the world is going on with this big lump underneath your armpit. Hmm. You know, these and many others like them are not just fire truck emergencies where the, the rescuers come and put out the fire and all the flames are extinguished and, and the problem goes away and it fades like smoke. No, these are abrupt, unforeseen intrusions into your life that have life-altering consequences, life-changing effects. And that's kind of why I'm using this as an introduction on this day that we're looking at last judgment, because last judgment should have a life-changing effect on how you go about your day-to-day business. Every, every single day. And that one day is going to have a life-changing effect on your future as well. That day will come suddenly. That last judgment day will come surprising. That day will come as if it had absolutely no advance warning, even though Jesus has been screaming, whispering, and shouting into your ear from the time that you could understand North American English words. Be watchful. Be ready. Be prepared. Even for us, God's children, whose names are written in the book of life, we can get so dulled. I'm not beating you up over this. I'm just saying, it's a true fact of life, isn't it? 
We can get dulled into a false sense of security that, you know, yeah, it's coming sometime. Yeah, Jesus said that, you know, there will be a last judgment, and he gives us some signs in Matthew 24 and 25, but those are the signs that have been going on since the beginning of the world. So how can we ever really know? And we can just kind of sit here this morning and take the opportunity and ask ourselves, is the last judgment, is the celebration or remembrance of this day of the last judgment, is it still relevant? Does it still have any impact or or notoriety or import for us whatsoever? That's really the question that we need to kind of be asking ourselves as we go through the sermon this morning. And if so, how does it have import on our life? How does it affect and change our thinking and our attitude as we go about as these sons and daughters of the king? But let's switch back to the gospel for a minute that we have before us today. We have this great picture of what appears to be this surprise act of intrusion into the affairs of the world on this cosmic, universal, cataclysmic scale. Some of Jesus' disciples had come to him and asked him, Tell us, Lord. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Bottom line, cut into the chase, Jesus says to his disciples, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And this is where I'm going to ask all the 12-year-old boys to use their sound effects and put on a screeching, a screeching car. We just hit the brakes and everybody plowed into the front seat. Okay. I have to address this. No one knows, not even the Son. And this is where the Jehovah's Witnesses, yes, I said it publicly, the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to beat you over the head with this and say, see, Jesus is not God. Because if Jesus were God, he would know the exact time that he's returning. And he says right here, no one knows, only the Father, the Son doesn't know. How do you address that? You know, let them just walk away. Let them drop the mic in front of you and say, ha ha, we won. What are you going to say to them? You rewind back to your catechism class, and if you had a good catechism teacher, he would have taught you, or mom, might have been mom, she would have taught you about Jesus' dual nature. 100% God, 100% man. Without getting into all of the three genii of Jesus, his myostoticum genus, his idiomatic Jesus, his majestic genus, we know that there are attributes of God that were attributed to the Son and got communicated to, I mean, communicated to his human nature. And there are attributes of his human nature that sort of kind of had an effect on the divine nature. And it's a whole communication of attributes that you study under the dual nature of Christ. And do you remember it ever being said to you that there are times when Jesus just speaks according to his human nature as if he had kind of put his divine nature on hold? Yeah, that's what's going on right here. Jesus is God, and he sets aside his divine nature here just like he sets sets aside his divine use of his powers, right? And he speaks according to his human nature, and according to his human nature, he does not know when he's going to be returning. So don't ever let anyone tell you that Jesus is not God. I don't want you to be tempted to have to punch him in the nose, It would be an evangelical punch. So then he follows up with two parables, two parables about being watchful and being faithful, and then he launches into our text for this morning, and it's the biggest description of the biggest bam um, T-bone confrontation between God the divine and this world that has ever happened. It's the last judgment. This is where everything's coming to a culmination. All right, so now before we get too much further into our text, um, let me ask you again. Is this topic of the last judgment still relevant to today? And if it is relevant today, how is it relevant for you today? How is it going to affect or change or alter your perceptions or your going about in the flesh in this world on a day-to-day basis? Is it still relevant? And if so, how? Have you noticed, for example, your friends are kind of just pounding in the tents 
10 pegs and sinking in their roots into this world even deeper and deeper, right? Of course they are, because they don't have anything else other than that to cling to. But because they are your friends, and you do love them and you like them, have you noticed that you're following suit? Have you noticed that you're pounding your tent pegs of this world in? And a tent, which is by nature supposed to be temporary housing. Yeah, have you followed, have you followed their lead? And this world is becoming just a little bit more permanent than God ever intended it to be for you. What about, um, do you ever catch yourself living like the people of Noah's day? People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. So is the topic of the last judgment still relevant? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, every human being who has ever lived and whoever has lived, those angels are going to miraculously somehow gather the entire population of the world, past tense and present tense, to come before the throne of the great judge, Jesus, our Savior. No one's going to be able to run away. No one's going to be able to hide behind their mom or under a mountain or at the bottom of the sea in some scuba gear. No one's going to be able to avoid this great and final judgment. It's not going to happen. Um, this should remind us, if you read the Bible on a fairly regular basis, there's this passage from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. And he's talking, he's relating how no one is going to be able to um, get away with sin, get away with the sin without God noticing. And this is the same exact situation. God says to Jeremiah to, to say to the people of Israel at that time, am I only a God nearby and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places that I cannot see him? Do I not fill the entire earth? Yes, yes, and yes. There's no avoiding this day. There's no escaping it. Sheep and goat, believer and unbeliever, white and black and pink and green and blue and purple, every single human being is going to be called to account before this great and mighty judge. What we have before us here is a glorious Bible picture of what the end is going to look like. Jesus calls his believers the sheep. And sheep, well, they're a little dumb sometimes, and they need a little bit of leading, right? Right? But goats, on the other hand, they're just nasty little creatures. I mean, by nature, they're kind of nasty little creatures. And those are the unbelievers, and those are the ones he's going to put on his left. And if you ever go back to this section, and people will say, see, it's all because of what they did that Jesus let them into heaven. Or what, it's because of what they didn't do, those goats didn't do, that they were not allowed into heaven. You need to read the Bible and go back to the first verse very carefully because what's already transpired? He's already made the determination and the division of the two. He's already determined who's the sheep and who's the goats. And now he starts expounding upon why the sheep are over here and the goats are over here. And that's where he talks about these good works that they've done as fruits of their faith as natural fruits of their faith, or no natural fruits of their faith because they have no faith to begin with. Okay. So is the topic of Judgment Day still relevant? Well, if the motor of your brain is still humming along with me at this early hour on a Sunday morning, and it's still um, firing away on all cylinders, you may have noticed a problem with the scene that I just described to you, because what I basically told you was that, according to this gospel lesson, that all of humanity, both the sheep and the goats, the believers and the unbelievers, everybody is going to be piled up before Jesus, before the great judge, all right, all together. But here's the problem. We're all sinners, and sinners are not allowed into heaven. Do you see the trouble there? How is this going to get reconciled? 
Because what that means is, is that even though we're sheep on this side and goats on this side, we're all still sinners. And that's a problem for admission into heaven. All right. Well, what you need to recall at this point, because sometimes it can slip away from our brains, is that there was a first coming. The first coming of the Son of God. The first coming of Jesus into this world. And he breathed the atmosphere of this world. And he had a perfectly virgin birth. And he had a perfectly sinless life that he lived here. And he had an absolutely perfectly sinless death. Taking the sins of us upon him. And being the greatest sinner that ever was. And exchanging his righteousness for, for um, our sin. And making us godly and holy in God's his father's sight. There's the empty tomb which proves that all of this is not just silly business or made-up fiction or folklore, but it's all true. And then you have this ascended Lord. You put together this entire package of his first coming, and what that spells is righteousness credited to sheep. Righteousness credited to children and sons and daughters of the king whose names have been written in the book of life. Righteousness credited to you. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. Right. Absolutely. So all those who have had their sins covered by this glorious King Jesus, this great Savior of our souls, whose blood has washed away all of our sins and who has left us in a state of being acquitted before God. And here's where I need to, to step aside just one more time. We, we say that our sins are forgiven. We, and that's true. We say that, um, that we have no more sins, that we're justified, we're righteous. All of that is true. But the Greek word really says that we're standing before this great judge, Right? And he doesn't declare guilty or not guilty because the truth of the matter is that we're guilty of sin. The Greek word that's used to describe our status there is he says you're acquitted. It means that you don't have to pay the punishment for your guilt. It means he lets you go. It means you get to move on with your life and continue breathing and working and loving and living as you were before. But the truth of the matter is don't ever forget that you are guilty as sin. And he took that sin. And he lets you live under his grace and his peace. Acquitted in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says about such sheep like you and me, through the obedience of the one man, and that one man is going to be Jesus, right? Right? the multitudes will be declared righteous. But for those who foolishly say, I don't need this Jesus, I don't mind if you call me a goat. Yeah, I know it's a four-letter word in God's mind, but I don't really care, right? I'm just going to push this aside and take his mercy and grace and try to make it on my own. On judgment day, they're going to be caught on the wrong side of Jesus' wrath on the wrong side of Jesus' justice. And basically the Bible says about such dumb goats, they will pay the penalty, namely, everlasting destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. What a sad outcome for souls that were desperately um, loved by God. From the very first fall, God moved heaven and earth to save such people, and they have the audacity and the arrogance to push away God's grace and mercy. It's sad. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit alone that can get through to them, but, they can, but God the Holy Spirit uses us as tools, as means, as messengers to be able to take this entire sermon and wrap it up in your own words to communicate to them the urgency of knowing who this, who this great Savior God judge is when he comes again. And knowing him not as a goat, but knowing him as a shepherd, or as a sheep who has this great shepherd. This great shepherd that will watch after my body and mend it when it's broken. This great shepherd that will remind me that I have loved ones in this world that he watches over when I cannot. 
The shepherd that reminds me that he, he does care about the souls of those who are in my family. The shepherd who, who has basically moved heaven and earth to make me his own. So, is the topic of Judgment Day still relevant? Especially for God's people whose names have been written in the book of life. You got two groups. To one, the judge is going to say, come. To the other, he's going to say, go. Apart from me. There's no middle road. There's no, um, no mulligans at this point. There's no do-overs. There's no second chances at this point. So what are we going to take home for ourselves this morning if this judgment day really does have relevance for us and it is going to affect how we go about our daily lives and how we conduct ourselves as Christians in this sad and dark and dying and fallen world? Well, I came up with a couple, and I hope that you can come up with a few more. The first one I thought is start by asking yourself, under what conditions and where and what will I be found doing when my Savior Jesus comes back again to judge the living and the dead? Number two, no one gets to say, I pick Jesus' right side. I pick Jesus' left side. You can't just live your entire life as a goat. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And he says he's determined you as a goat on his left side. And you start arguing with him about it. No, I want to be on the right side. It's too late. It's too late. Jesus does the choosing. And he does the choosing based upon what he finds in your heart. Does he find faith, trust, belief that Jesus is the Savior from all sin, the Savior of humanity, the Savior of you? The third thing I came up with that you might consider that you can take with you this morning is the sheep's good works are evidence of their faith in Jesus and their trust in Jesus and their love for Jesus. They're not... Um, evidence-based payments for or entrance fees that they pay off to get into the kingdom of God. You can't pay enough. In, in fact, if we made every last person on this planet trillionaires, no poverty. Well, the socialists would like that. No poverty. It still would not be enough to buy a, buy the, or pay for the sinfulness of all humanity. Only Jesus can do that. Number four, I guess maybe it's a little bit of a personal observation. No more living for today. No, you live as if today was the last day that you're going to be on this planet. See how that would alter your, your worldview and who you would make time for, and what would be your priorities as a, as a child of God. And the last thing I came up with, and I know there's a whole lot more, so is the, is the topic of Judgment Day still relevant? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes, because what it does is it takes our time of grace, the time that we have between our, our birth and our death, to be brought to a knowledge of the saving truth about Jesus as our only Savior from sin. It takes our time of grace and it puts it into perspective. And it gives us a sense of urgency, right? Not only about our own spiritual life and our relationship with God, but those who are in our families and those who are around us and we come into contact with. Jesus said, no one knows about that day or hour. Only the Father so who do you know, sitting there right now, who's the one that pops into your head, who needs to know and hear this story about the great judge on Judgment Day whose name is Jesus and his title is the Christ? Who, needs, who do you know who needs to hear that? To hear that Jesus, being connected to the correct side, not just the right side, but the correct side of Jesus and having him as his relationship, that your passing from this life is not going to be some sort of random, sudden, 
um, out of the clear blue with no advance warning, um, active intervention, but it's going to be a promised activity of redemption that he has promised to you. No surprises here. And then, when that day comes, and we can sing some of the words right now, you will have this word, the words from this hymn floating through your brain. O sweet and blessed country, the home of God's elect. O sweet and blessed country that eager hearts expect. Were they who with their leader have conquered in the fight forever and forever are clad in robes of white. Jesus in mercy bring us to that dear land of rest where sings the hosts of heaven your glorious name to bless. And to that, let all God's people say amen. Please stand. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Amen. I direct your eyes now.